I should have known better than that. We're not going to start again. No. <laughs> okay. So You're we'll still Stephen Crow. Uh, the front end tooling and panel discussion. So we're going to do this a couple of ways. I'm assuming with all you here, you have some questions for our experts on the panel. Uh, so what I'd love you to do is if you could come down to the bottom step here, we'll get your questions. And if you don't have questions just yet, we'll also ask the panelists to um, tell us about things that they're interested in, they're concerned about, and things they want you to know. So let's start today by um, getting from the panelists a two-minute response each from that keynote session we just had. Two-minute response. You can step right up here. Any thoughts? I'll start. Thanks for saying this. All right, no problem. You guys have time to think. I'll just nice. run off of the mouth for a while. So, um, so JavaScript is awesome. JavaScript is something that I've been exploring a lot lately. Um, and Dries talking about incorporating React or any kind of JavaScript library into Drupal is amazing. Uh, right now, the, the front-end engineering experience is moving away from what, what I've historically done, which is like 20 years of PHP, HTML, CSS, and is moving towards these JavaScript libraries. A lot of the articles that I'm reading on Medium, a lot of the people that I'm talking to out in the industry are building in React first, and they kind of look at me like I'm an old man whenever I talk about PHP. Maybe that's because I am, but, you know, PHP is stable. So as a result, like all of this movement towards API first and being able to build in these new environments is exciting. Um, it's drawing a lot of new people in and it's sort of also bridging the gap between uh, backend engineering and front-end engineering. In Drupal, we have like these, this almost separation of concern where it's like, you know, listen, I need you to install the site, do a lot of like the content modeling while I'm going to like make it pretty and express it and theme it. Um, whereas with JavaScript, libraries, a lot of that engineering and front-end work goes hand-in-hand. Hand in hand. Um, I've been working on some React projects, just a few, uh, and right now a lot of my team is convinced that, the, that our React projects going faster is an aberration. Um, we've done some sort of like post-mortems and it's like, well, you know, we, we got it done early because the client was really good or, you know, we've got sharp people working on this project. And I'm actually convinced that React is going to um, bring down the amount of time that we spend on engineering on projects. And so, um, so I think that, that these JavaScript libraries and working in React are a really positive uh, movement forward. So that's my two-minute ramble. I hope you guys have something more comprehensive. Uh, and I'll step aside. Great. So as I think about it, I think about one of the guiding principles at Redfin is the hedgehog concept from uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, where the, the coyote can come up with, with tons and tons of clever ways to try to you know, get the hedgehog. The hedgehog only has one tactic, which is to sort of curl up in a ball and be spiky and not get eaten. And that works really well. So it's about you know doing one thing well, and I think that's what it's like for Redfin. So historically, for us, that niche has been to do Drupal. And uh, we haven't touched any other framework. We don't do anything except Drupal uh, since we really, since our inception in about 2005 with our first Drupal 4.7 site. Um, we did that, we never looked back. So what I'm especially excited about is the way that um, Dries tends to always be very uh, forward thinking, very insightful about what the future of technology brings. And so, you know, we didn't really learn jQuery until jQuery was in core and there was an announcement and there's a thing to do it. And um, those decisions have historically been really great uh, for Drupal, for the project, and for the sites we build. So uh, I'm particularly excited. Uh, I think about the choice of React, and one of the things that makes me particularly excited about that is is React Native. So once you sort of become a React developer, you are almost pretty close to, to an app developer as well. So I think that's a great way that um, our business can open up, um, it, but but still stay in that hedgehog concept of doing doing one thing really well. So it, it's it's you know Dries is forward thinking and thinking about the future of technology, and that's always paid off really well for us. That's my reaction. Yeah, uh, I think as a Drupal agency, one of the things that we've found over the past, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years is that it's really difficult to find developers that can bridge the gap from the front end to the back end. And in Drupal, it's not necessarily one of our 
the things that we do particularly well, separating those two. So I'm really excited about the API first initiatives that are happening in the sense that they're gonna open up a lot of opportunities for us to hire front end specific people, uh, to be able to work independently of the Drupal teams and to have those, those two separate teams really work well together. So that's what I'm most excited about, just kind of the, the opportunities that it brings to diversify the staff. Great, thank you. First question, who's gonna go to? Nobody. There you go. I guess I could just go boom, react. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, no, I was wondering uh, if you folks, uh, it's a particular area of interest for me, think about like front end tooling, uh, if you guys do any work with. Uh, some cases, but um, pattern libraries or uh, shout guides and how that fits into the workflow. And, um, yeah, just that in general, you know, maybe technologies around in the digital world. Cool. I'd love to jump on this. Yeah, one. go right ahead. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, I believe pretty strongly in the idea of component theming. Um, we built a, a product called Mannequin, which is very similar to uh, Pattern Lab. And we believe strongly that those UI components should be built separately from the rest of the site. And I think that's really what something like Pattern Lab or Mannequin or uh, you were talking about yeah. another one that I think you'll bring up in a second. Uh, so like, I think that's what that enables is that separation of concerns. And again, that, that really leads to like a strong front end being able to coexist with a strong back end. You can have two separate teams working on it, and it enables a much better workflow. Go ahead. So uh, the answer is yes. Um, working as a, in patterns or components uh, is really the strategy for the future of web design. I mean, it's the now as well, um, because we're not building pages anymore. We're building these large complicated systems. As a designer, talking with clients and trying to get them to understand those sort of component libraries is a little bit difficult at times, um, which uh, Pattern Lab does an excellent job of showing off those components. Uh, Storybook does the same thing for React so that we can be thinking in components and use those tools um, internally as part of the development team. Uh, I don't think that those tools are rich enough um, to properly communicate to the clients when they should use those tools, what those tools are for, and how to critically evaluate them. Um, if you look at a lot of the design systems and pattern libraries that are out there that are that are client or customer facing, like Salesforce's Lightning or um, IBM's Carbon Design, um, those are really kind of almost like style guide guides to borrow from Brad Frost's um, thinking on the on the tap on the particular subject. Um, and so, yes, we definitely work in components and work with these libraries. Um, for Drupal, uh, just to put it forth a little bit, we actually have a theme for Drupal 8 called Emulsify that, allow, that has Pattern Lab baked in. Um, and so it allows you to connect those Pattern Lab components directly with Drupal. So um, we're seeking like a single source of truth at some point. Uh, I gave a talk yesterday about maintaining design consistency across multiple channels. And uh, Airbnb has a React Sketch app repo where you can actually have um, your patterns defined in React and then exported into Sketch. Um, it's very beta. I looked at it last night. I have to laugh because JavaScript is moving so fast that like yesterday I thought it was the gold standard and today I'm like, it needs work. Uh, so there you have it. I think one thing that um, is sometimes missing in that is, is that while Drupal I think is, is moving to ambitious projects that um, there's still a, a road for people who uh, are not communicating uh, with their clients at the pattern library level, and that's not where the negotiation takes place. Um, you know, we do things very agilely, and we actually, um, once we have, you know, wires and we have designs, we start working towards um, building out the pages in the way that we've shown them to the client. 
but we still want a style guide for a number of other reasons, which would be uh, developer documentation, um, knowing what patterns have been used in case a new feature comes down the road eight or ten months from now. And so we use a tool called Herman, which is a, a style guide static site generator uh, created by Oddbird that kind of sits in this like pre-enterprise space, I think, where you can generate a style guide, but it does it using SAS doc, kind of like um, Nile style sheets, KSS, or living CSS, so that you can generate a style guide while you're writing the actual CSS. And um, that can grow with you because you can be writing the CSS as you build the website, or if you're doing any prototypes in browser or something, you can document it as you go and get your style guide done that way. So. Um, that's a tool that, that I love, and if anyone saw my presentation on it yesterday, you'll know that I love it. Um, but I think there's that value there is that not everyone um, building these projects is able to communicate with their clients around the pattern library, but that the clients themselves, they're not as hip as we are to component-based design and atomic design, so they still think about web pages. Uh, and, and I think that that's a really good tool that we use uh, and it's built right into our build process uh, to generate the style guide as we go. That's kind of cool. So for someone who hasn't done any pattern laundry work yet, what would you guys recommend as a good starting point? Herman. <laughs> what other tools, so Herman you just mentioned, yeah. what other direction, tools or resources would you point people in a direction to sort of get themselves rolling? I mean, I think there are I think there are a few uh, options out there as far as pre-baked themes. You guys have Emulsify. Uh, we offer a scaffold that people can start from that includes Mannequin. Gesso. Gesso uh, <laughs> is a Pattern Lab uh, distribution put out by Phase 2, is that right? Form 1. Form 1. Uh, yeah, so there are a few different options out there on like pre-baked solutions that you can bring in immediately. How many people are in that position of wanting to get into the pattern libraries and haven't yet? So everyone else is in, so we're probably 20 to 30 percent uh, trying. The only other thing that I'd recommend if you're really starting out with it is you got to read Brad Frost's stuff. You got to read the atomic design uh, principles. Um, there's a slide I've seen for the last few years. I saw it in Brian Prager's uh, presentation this morning that shows the, the, the levels from, from atoms to molecules to organisms. Uh, if you can look at that slide and picture by itself and describe all that, then you, you've hit phase one and then you can move on to tools. But understanding all those concepts is super important. And just to steal the microphone, I mean, I'm interested in, and I'm giving a talk to you, and it touches on myself. Do you think it's a good place for people to start if they're new to thinking? Like if you were coming to Drupal in a day, would you take the component pattern library approach? So my answer to that would be a more holistic view. Um, you know, no one person is a silo. Like, you know, you're usually working as part of a team. Um, so you might be doing the, the front end development, but typically you'll probably be working with some back end people. Um, and you'll also be working with designers and marketers and editors uh, of the process of, as well. So you have to take into account that, um, that you have this entire flow. So component Component-based design um, is strong for designing the things that like you need to build out the site. But one of the things that it doesn't do very well is give you a. It's more of a in the trees sort of way and less looking at the forest. So you really have to balance those two perspectives as you do it. So component-based like design is great, um, but you typically have to start with a little bit more of a holistic view. Like, so I, do, I deal with a lot of clients doing design work, and if I were to show them like form fields and buttons just kind of floating in space, they would, they would laugh at me. They, they don't want to review anything that way. They want to look at it like they want the form page to take a look at. So you have to, to, to balance the, the needs of the workflow that you have against what tools you use. So um, someone starting out in web design or web development, like front-end theming, I would definitely say that component-based uh, design is a process that should be used, but it should not be, it, you should look at the whole as well, making sure that you're balancing uh, a large-scale view versus also the component-scale view. Cool. Thanks, guys.
Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. No, that was. I, I have questions? nothing to add to that. <laughs> That's yeah. brilliant. Um, I got a question. So, a conference like this often is sessions about what's coming next and what's hot, right? I want to ask you guys a question, which is, what uh, what would you recommend if people are still doing today that they should stop? Like, what are the bad things they should be doing if if they're still using less or do whatever it is that you you think people should move away from as quick as possible? What are those things? The number one thing that it always surprises me. I, so I take the front end tooling survey every year. I want to, you know, contribute, and I also want to, you know, get that data set and look at it. And one of the things that persistently su surprises me, it shouldn't, but it does, is that like about forty to fifty percent of people writing front end code, writing CSS, are not using a CSS preprocessor. So, so like you mentioned, like should they stop using less? Um, I think the problem is bigger than that. I think there's a lot of people writing vanilla JavaScript um, who are doing it without without thinking that they've got preprocessors that they can use. Um, those preprocessors give various affordances that will make writing the code a lot easier and, and nicer. Now, when I say preprocessors, you can choose whatever your flavor is. You know, if you like less, keep going with less. You know, I'm not going to you know, live your best life. Um, uh, personally, I want to move to post CSS because I want to write. I want to write vanilla JavaScript, but I want to do it in a way that's complicated. Vanilla CSS. So what's that? Vanilla CSS. V just uh, not not writing SAS or less, but okay. writing like. You said vanilla JavaScript. And I'm, I'm like, sorry. Wait a minute. What? Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm drunk. Um, <laughs> vanilla CSS. Uh, but I want to do it in a way that's complicated and using preprocessors and all of that. So the number one thing that I think that people should do is realize that there are a wealth of tools out there that can make their job easier and make more sense. Uh, yeah, I think what I would add to that is that we have a similar situation with, with JavaScript where, you know, this is an aspirational thing for many people in the Drupal community, but there's this whole new standard of ES6 JavaScript happening right now that is very hot outside of our community. And I'm a little worried that I still see us writing, you know, vanilla jQuery stuff, and that when the shift comes where that's just not gonna cut it anymore, which arguably has already happened, uh, we're gonna get left in the dust. So I think that as a community, we should all probably start looking really hard at ES6, how to integrate that into our existing builds, and how to elevate our JavaScript to the next level. I have two probably somewhat controversial takes on this, and I think I might take uh, Rob's approach and, and notch it up. And, and, and I don't mean to say that any of these are immediately today, but I think you probably could stop writing jQuery. Uh, I think that we have so much great vanilla JavaScript things that we can use now that we don't need jQuery. We have query selector and query selector all. Um, we have for each iterators. Um, and, and I think a lot of this stuff comes with ES6. So I, I totally would piggyback on that to say um, that next gen JavaScript is coming. Uh, Dries talked about how, how some of those frameworks are coming in and you know we're still doing a lot of work in Drupal 7 and you pull that up and that's that's a far cry away um, but using a transpiler and, and using I've heard two people say Babel today is it Babel. Uh, it's Babel right Babel. all right I'm going with Babel um, so I, yeah I totally think that and I think number two is um, I, I kind of want to duck behind the podium after I says, but like I think stop using gulp and grunt. Um, I think um, the the front end developer survey that came out this year had a huge um, surprise to me, which was the the user base of grunt in the last year has diminished really significantly from even one year ago, um, and gulp usage has diminished pretty significantly as well in favor of. Uh, using scripts in your package JSON. So if you're using, so I'd say right now, if you're not using a front-end build process, you need to start doing that. And um, you can use Yarn scripts and use a lot of these packages that are out there to to do your 
pre-processing, post-processing, and I think that, that had the biggest share of what people are doing these days are using Yarn scripts or, or NPM scripts to do their to do their build process. And so I think that's um, that was a big surprise to me, and that's sort of a. Okay, guys, what uh, questions would you like to post to each other? And have to answer? Do you have yeah. any of those before I go through my list? Yeah, so I um, had the idea for this panel because at Redfin we recently kind of looked at what our build process was and decided to move into something that was a little more modern. Um, part of the impetus for that was Herman, but not uh, the entirety of it. Uh, Herman sort of requires a modern build process, but for a long time we were using uh, Ruby SAS with Bundler and Gem Files and using the SUSE grid framework. And we sort of, you know, revisited all of that and we had skipped over gulp and grunt. Like we inherited some sites that were using that, that process and, but we one time tried to implement it and then we got to the tail end of it and we're like, did this really help us any more than, than using Bundler and gem files? And we said no. And then when it came along again, we replaced that with uh, Dart SAS. So we skipped over sort of gulp and grunt and are using the new replacement for Ruby SAS to do our are pre-compiling. But during that process of evaluating all these things and seeing what was out there, I was really overwhelmed. So part of my um, impetus for starting the panel was kind of to take a survey of what people are using. I think that there's a lot of different things, but if you could describe your, your current build process or ideal build process for, you know, if you were starting your own project from scratch, what kind of tools would you use? And so I can say that we're using Dart SAS for a preprocessor uh, to compile. We're using Yarn scripts to do the build process. We're using Yarn over NPM, but that's even then I think that might be in flux because really we went with Yarn because NPM didn't even support lock files at the time that we chose Yarn. Um, and post CSS to do auto prefixing. And gosh, there's probably a few few other things in there, but that's kind of what we settled on after all this process. And selfishly, the question I want to ask is, what is everyone else doing, and did we did we do this right at all? Um, so I'm curious to hear that from other folks too. Sure. Go for it. Okay. So basically, the um, the build process that works is the build process that we use. Like, um, that's, that's the, the long and the short of it. Um, we do have some things that we've standardized upon. Um, we actually still kind of go back and forth between Yarn and NPM based on the project. Um, it depends on the developers. Um, let's see, we use Gulp uh, as opposed to using NPM scripts. Uh, the reason that we use Gulp instead of going you know, off the deep end on NPM scripts is that Gulp provides a uh, consistent user interface for all of those extra packages. Um, which means that whenever we hand off between different developers, there's a little bit of consistency. Um, if you've ever written NPM scripts, um, each of them has their own documentation, their own lingo, their own patterns. Uh, and so whenever you're trying to use them, you have to, to implement them in the ways that they want to be implemented. Uh, when using Gulp, it gives you, you just pipe everything through, you set the options that you need to set, um, and it creates a better developer experience. Um, uh, as I said before, your mileage may vary, whatever works for your team. Um, I know that we have a lot of JavaScript engineers who prefer NPM scripts. That's great. They write it in the readme and everybody's able to do what they're supposed to do. Um, so we, let's see, uh, we're still using SAS. Um, I want to move to, to uh, post CSS, uh, but we haven't made a big move yet. Uh, I'm waiting for us to do, we typically do a once a year front end developer retreat where we talk about big picture things and this is one of the things I'm going to talk about um, during, with big picture stuff. Um, we're also talking, talking about uh, mainstream adoption of CSS grid into what we're doing. Um, so uh, that's something that we're evaluating, um, I'm trying to think. That's, I think that covers it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so at last call, we have 
like a standard set of tools that we like to start from. Uh, we don't always get the option, but when we do, uh, our standard set is pretty similar to what these guys just said. Uh, we've got Yarn, Gulp, uh, we use Node SAS, and we use Post, uh, sorry, Auto Prefixer. Uh, to do all of our SAS compilation, uh, we use some basic gulp stuff to do, you know, asset minification, JavaScript transpiling, that kind of stuff. Um, on the other side, we actually have standardized on new builds with Foundation. Uh, so that's a CSS and JavaScript framework uh, that allows us to get up and running pretty quickly with some good defaults. I think, to be honest, that that was stemming from a previous lack of front-end experience that we had. And I think we've built those chops up to a point where we probably don't need foundation anymore, but it's still there in the stack and it provides us with like a stable starting place. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So that's, that's our stack. Oh, right. And as far as where I want to head, uh, I'm definitely looking ahead to some better transpiling mechanisms. Uh, Webpack is definitely an option for the future. I would love to replace Gulp altogether and just have all of the asset compilation happen through something like uh, Webpack or uh, there's a new one. Parcel? Parcel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think we do want to be dropping Gulp. It's sort of a little bit long in the tooth and isn't necessarily the best tool for the job these days, but we haven't gotten there yet. So all three of you have mentioned that we're using this and we're thinking about this and we'd like to go here. What are some of the things you think about in terms of making those decisions? Uh, what are the, the decision points? You know, how do you handle the old stuff versus the new stuff? And what are your strategies around making these decisions and implementing them? Easy question? No, it's oh. not. <laughs> but I have a funny story about it, which is that um, one thing that we started doing as part of our, uh, we started writing make files for uh, syncing sites, refreshing sites, especially once we got into Drupal 8 and using config management in like a fairly proper way. Um, you know, when you need to refresh your local site and start a new feature in a new feature branch, you have to sync the database down, import the config, because we're using config split to merge in our development settings to, you know, turn off the caches and all that stuff. So we're writing make files for that. So in the previous world, we were using make files to compile our, our, all of our assets and do all the things that, that Yarn scripts are doing. And, and I had the whole team in there at my desk and I was showing them the differences between like using yarn scripts and using a make file and like just literally everyone shrug, shrugged their shoulders. Like it was so six one way and half dozen the other. We just like, we, we came like this close to just flipping a coin. And we ended up on yarn scripts. I, I'm not even sure why. I think because we're already pulling in dependencies with Yarn and, you know, it's just one less thing that, that we're doing, but we still have a make file for the other, other tasks. So for me, I'd say punting to the team is, is pretty important. I really think that we're going to just have a front end retreat someday, which is still probably our whole company. So that'll be, that'll be nice. We'll get two retreats a year this way. Um, but I think buy in is really the, the most important thing. And I think that's a luxury that we have as a little bit of a smaller shop that, you know, it's, it's easier to order pizza for, for like four people than for like 40 people um, to get them to, to agree on something. Um, but I think it speaks to Randy's point that like the process that works is the process that works. So I think the important thing is um, making sure that you've got the buy-in. I think that's, that's an important aspect of it. The other things to consider are, you know, one thing that I look at a lot when I'm choosing any technology is popularity. And that may not be a, a super popular stance, but the reason I do that is because with more, you know, the more eyes you have, all bugs are shallow. So um, using a tool that is used by a lot of people is important to me because it means when something goes wrong, there's probably a blog post about it. There's probably an issue in the issue queue about it. So that's an important factor for me is choosing tools that are that are popular uh, because it means we're going to hit smaller bumps when we hit those bumps. 
So I think that I can uh, boil down those decisions to people, stability, stack overflow, and contractors. Okay, so the people who are doing the work have to enjoy doing the work. If you decide, if, if your team decided that, that make files were the devil, and despite the fact that they were on par with yarn, if you went that way, they wouldn't be happy. So you need to make sure that the people who are working on the projects are working on tools that give them some degree of satisfaction and autonomy. Um, then you have um, stability. The tools that you're working with have to be at least to a certain degree mature. Um, you don't, if you're, when you're on the cutting edge, you lose a lot of blood, okay? You end up spending a lot of time investing and in trying to find out why the documentation is short, why, you know, you don't have the robust tool set that you need. And so you have to do a lot of exploration and sometimes contributing back to the open source project that you're using, which is a valuable thing to do. And I actually recommend people contribute to open source. But when you do it as part of a business, that turns into a little bit of a loss and you have to, to be willing to to accept that. So people, stability, stack overflow. So stack overflow, whenever I say that, it's just kind of like a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, you know, people have to be able to seek help. They have to be able to like ask their peers and say, like, listen, I've got this this problem with this tool chain that I'm working on. You know, so like, you know, if, if you're doing like cutting edge React, that that you know, that circle's pretty small. But if you've got a PHP question, you know, my mom can answer it. So not really, my mom's not that good. Um, she barely knows how to use an iPad. Um, so, you know, Stack Overflow is important, you know, being able to, to find those answers. And then lastly, contractors. Um, I mentioned this because it's a consideration whenever you're working on a project that you want to be able to bring more people onto the project if you need that. And I use the term contractors to represent either new hires that you bring in on projects or people that you're partnering with for projects, whether they're team augmentation or hiring out to another, another service. When you make a, a tool chain decision, you have to make sure sure that you can bring those people on board and they understand what's going on. You know, if I'm going to hire another front-end developer, they're going to need to know our tool chain and like how easy or hard is that. Um, this is personally one of the reasons I'm super excited about like Drupal 8's front end work and moving towards API first because there are more people doing React front end development than are interested in doing like PHP development. So, um, so it's easy, it's easy to find React front end people. It's easy to find people who can use Twig. It is not so easy for Drupal like seven style PHP theming, um, you know, and so you need to be able to bring people in. So there's a, a whole lot of concerns whenever we're choosing a, a tool chain. I don't have a lot to add to that. Uh, I would echo that we primarily choose based on the direction that the community is heading. And I'm not just talking about the Drupal community, I'm also talking about you know, the web, commu web development community as a whole. So like, you know, my interest in Webpack right now is based on the fact that that is the de facto tool for a lot of JavaScript work that's happening. And again, we do want to be able to hire uh, a contractor that can just come in and understand what's already going on. So that's, that's like our, our primary focus is in making sure that we're using tools that are going to be standards and that are going to be well supported in the future. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, we often uh, work with clients who, once we deliver the final product, <coughs> they have internal developers who are less experienced uh, than us and they maintain it going forward. So one of the challenges is when we start using more modern tooling that they're less familiar with, figuring out a way that we can hand it off to them so that they can make potentially small changes or just maintain them as if like a dependency needs to be updated. Um, so how, how do you best work, uh, work in that if, if you do so what that's work? Excellent question. So, um, so the question is, you know, what do you do whenever the team that you're working with that you're going to hand the project off to um, has a has developers who aren't as sophisticated or aren't as on the cutting edge as the tools that you prefer to work with? Um, my preferred process for this um, is that we bring a developer into the discovery process of a project. Part of the reason that we do that is that developer then talks to the developers on their team to find out what are they comfortable with, what are they okay with. Um, we, we've worked um, 
you know, whenever Drupal 8 first came out, we wanted to work on some Drupal 8 sites. And part of the discovery process with a client would be to find out, are you willing to make the investment in your people to move to Drupal 8 because your people are going to need to be trained? Um, and some said yes, some said no. And so that's part of the process, making sure that when you're kicking off a project, you're not just um, acting as the hand of God saying that like you're going to get a React front end, but instead to engage with them and find out part of their requirements. Um, you know, part of their requ they may want to to go to that future place that you're at. Um, we recently launched a site for PRI that was a React front end on a Drupal 7 site, um, and they approached us saying, "Hey, we want to do this in React. You know, can you show us how?" And we built it for them, and we talked them through that process. And so so, um, so yeah, my, my answer to your question is, is as early as, as you can in the process, in the discovery, find out what they're comfortable with, and then, you know, you that's one of the requirements for the project, is that your tool chain is something that they can adopt. Yeah, and along those lines, I think uh, some documentation goes a long way. So, uh, for example, like, we created the last call scaffold, our sort of like starting point for every project a long time ago. And we were seeing that we were getting through projects and handing them off and the client development teams couldn't manage them. Because there's a lot of things that go into that. I mean, there's CI processes that have to run before it goes up to wherever. Uh, there are multiple, you know, package management tools in there. It's a lot of complexity. but. Uh, what we found is that we were able to add documentation and process to our own tooling that allowed us to pass that off more confidently. So we had a thing all of a sudden that not only could we onboard our new developers faster because we had that documentation, but we could also hand it off to the client team and be reasonably confident that they could figure out where they were headed with it. We have documentation on all of the tools, all of the processes, all of the like overall concepts and make sure that that stuff stays up to date. Because it's what we use every day, uh, it does naturally stay up to date. So I think that's certainly a, a fundamental component to it. Make sure that you have explanation for what you're handing someone. The front here, um, has any, have any of you tried uh, Robo? project or look, using Composer itself, because um, I, I, I've always known you could like add Composer commands as a class, but I learned you could put Composer scripts and then the key becomes the command name and then whatever's in there just runs. So I made a theme build command in Composer JSON just to like RM or F this theme and then you know all the other hundred built from things it needs to do, and I put that right in Composer JSON. And it comes with composer command. So I'm wondering if any of you tried that or looked at the, you know, you know about the Robo um, mm -hmm. yeah. dot li project? Yep. Yeah, so uh, we use composer commands pretty extensively. That's like how you pull a database down with our, our framework. Um, and going beyond that, you can actually go ahead and write a PHP class with a static method and call that from a composer script. That works. So that's kind of cool. But at the same time, personally, I don't love mixing my tooling with what's going to go to production. So like, I would almost prefer to write my build stuff in JavaScript and then just not send that JavaScript to production, depending on what you're doing. So would you store that in a separate repo or something? Or? Uh, no, we just don't send it in the artifact. When, when that's built, we'll like strip it out before we send it to Pantheon or Acquia or whatever. Um, Robo is an interesting project and it is a lot of fun to play with, but I think to me that suffers from the same thing. Like you're starting to mix dependencies and I would rather just have that stuff in an entirely separate place, not mixed in with my production dependencies. Uh, I have seen some pretty cool stuff that you can do with Robo just in terms of like chaining things together writing your deployment scripts, and it does work well. But yeah, I think that's my, my concern with it. Anyone else? Yeah. I think what I would mention is, is that I, I think the trend in, in this Drupal industry is that we are beginning to sort of separate and segregate. So I you know, say that I'm a full stack developer, and I feel like that's a little bit of a, of a dirty word. Um, 
but I think you know the, if the front end stuff lives here, let's make that front end build process live here. Whereas I feel like Composer and PHP is is part of the the site build process and more of the back end stuff. So it's it's possible that I would do um, some Composer scripts for that. I looked at Robo. I looked at um, Make Files. We ultimately went with Make Files and for a lot of the same reason I went with Yarn scripts. Is like. I'm very comfortable Unix command line, and that stuff felt the most natural to me. Whereas, a few, you know, when I was looking at this before I got heavy into Drupal 8, my object oriented was pretty rusty, and so writing classes was, was not super appealing to me. Um, so I, I checked out Robo, and then we also use a deployment tool, which I presented on NedCamp a few years back, uh, called Magellan's, which is a PHP based deployment tool. Uh, where you can write PHP classes and custom commands in there. So I, I looked at all of those different things. And another thing I looked at, which is worth mentioning, is Drupal console supports uh, chaining commands. You write, you write a YAML file that can execute you know, eight uh, Drupal console commands in a row, and you can use that. So there's a ton of tools out there, and it's about what fits. But for me, it's about separating those processes so you know as we grow and we're hiring into a front-end role they're in node and or yarn or whatever and they're um, sort of live in that theme folder and do all the stuff there so um, I, I still go back to what works is what works and so I, I don't think that there's necessarily a downside that I could speak to globally about that process but that's why it didn't work for us question in the back super, super quick oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so if it were like an external library, and it was just in Composer uh, Dev, for example, required Dev, and that was just like a helper for the build process, and that wouldn't go in your FX production, that might, in theory, be an avenue for some kind of common library for command building and stuff? I would say yes, yeah. for sure. Yes. That, that's why there are the, the sort of dev dependencies yeah. for that. Yeah. But you know, I mean, there's a hat in, in the thing, and there's all these other things going into the Composer template. Yeah. Yeah. That clearly might wouldn't want to be there, so maybe if it's structured in a way we can leverage the required dev instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, so, um, so we're talking about finding tooling. I didn't even hear either three of you mention what you're doing as far as lighting or testing. I'm curious if you guys are doing either of those in your processing, okay. um, whether it's regression testing, visual regression testing, CSS linting, JavaScript linting, what tools you guys are using. Yeah, good point. So I knew I was forgetting stuff when I sort of overviewed the stack. So we are using uh, SASLint, which I think is a, a Snugug, Sam Richard uh, involved project. He was a, I don't know, he's still at IBM, but he was a Drupal guy sort of back in the day. So we're using SASLint to do linting. Um, I very recently went through the entire doc and figured out what should be a warning and what should, so like we used it very much out of the box and default for a while and I finally was like I don't know if I really care that these are alphabetical or not right so I I went through and I really looked and made a sort of redfin standard for SASLint for what should be an error and what should be a warning uh, so we're using SASLint uh, right before there are certain things which are an error and so our build process will stop if uh, you hit that and so you've got to fix that before you continue on um, I have not gotten into any JS linting um, because I think we have not yet adopted enough JavaScript. I think we're about to really start to embrace that. We're, we're dipping into React and we're going to need a JS linter soon. Um, but I have not used for testing of the best tool. I, think I also recently did a visual regression uh, testing evaluation of like everything that was out there. And the best thing I found uh, far and away is called Backstop.js. So it was really easy to set up. Uh, we're using uh, backstop right now. You know, again, we've automated the commands to sort of uh, take the snapshots before and then take another set of snapshots right before you think your feature's ready to merge and see what you've messed up. Um, backstop is an awesome tool. And it, that's what it does. It uses Puppeteer or it can use Chromey. It can use uh, Slimer. It can use Phantom, so there's all these pluggable backends of how to deal with taking your automated screenshots of your website. Um, and Puppeteer's the new default, and that works really well. Um, so that I want to be more of an automated process that's part of our um, 
deployment strategy and continuous integration, we're not there yet, but it's a really amazing tool that I think we can build in. Um, and we're not yet there with BHAT, and I wish we were, so I think that's an area where um, that's the tool that we're certainly going to choose for user testing, and we are totally not there with uh, JavaScript testing, but I think Nightwatch, because again, I sort of follow the trend of you know where Drupal's headed in that recently is going to be an 8.6, so I'd probably reach for Nightwatch to do JS testing. So I spoke a lot on that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, so linting is amazing. Um, it has helped me stop writing bad code. It's really nice. Um, so we use style lint for CSS. We use ESLint for JavaScript. Um, we use the Airbnb uh, JavaScript standard and ESLint. Um, it's pretty tight, pretty restrictive, but that's okay because it teaches you um, how to write strong code. Um, let's see, what else do we do? We do commit lint on some of our projects. It depends on who the engineers are. Um, I personally like it because what that does is that restricts the format of your commit messages in the repo um, to give it a, a structure. And so you're able to generate release notes from that structure more quickly um, and um, in a way that's more concise and makes more sense. And then, oh no, there was one last one I wanted to mention, but I've forgotten it. Um, but at any rate, um, linting is, is very important in making sure that code struck, oh, prettier, that's it. We're using prettier as well. So um, prettier, if you're not familiar with it, is a, um, it's a script that when you save your file, it compares against the ES lint that you have or the style lint that you have and reformats your code to the standards that you've put in your linter. So that means that you don't have to write it, save it, then find out like as it's recompiling that you've got like a bunch of errors in your code. When you save the file, it will automatically rewrite it uh, to meet the standard that you have. So that means you can write it sloppy, save it, and then everything is formatted perfectly. Um, it's a little bit like magic and it's a little bit frustrating the first few times you use it, um, but when you get used to it, it's pretty amazing. So, we are, yeah, we are out of time, but we have one last comment. Okay, I'll make this quick. Uh, I'm just gonna put out a plug that I think for visual regression testing, we should all be looking toward those component libraries as our like system of record there. And we've implemented Backstop.js and WebDriver I.O. with the visual regression uh, plugin very effectively on component libraries. Visual regression testing is really hard to do on a Drupal site, but if you have Pattern Lab, Mannequin, whatever running in the background, that's where you should do it. So that's all I wanted to say. Nice. Yes. Okay, well that wraps up time. I'm sure if you have any additional questions, please be happy to answer them after. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for coming.